نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم بعثه الله رحمه للعالمين ونصلي عليه في الاولين وفي الاخرين وفي الملاء الاعلى الى يوم الدين اوصيكم نفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل كما جاء في محكم التنزيل يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون Dear brothers and sisters we begin our day with an abundant praise and gratitude towards our beloved creator and we begin any valuable speech and any reality that we recognize with the praise and gratitude towards our creator who has blessed us with this life and surrounded us with favors and blessings the most precious gem of guidance is the holy quran and when we read the holy quran we have to read it looking for depth afala yatadabbaruna alquran we're challenged don't they ponder and contemplate over the quran and so today we're going to talk about a big misunderstanding that has become common amongst many muslims particularly here in the west where it is the worst place for such a misunderstanding to happen in relying upon reading the quran translation or even the original arabic uh, without understanding the meaning and so today we're going to talk about a concept is islam an exclusivist religion or is it mercy to the whole world that's the question is it exclusivist we're the chosen people with the holy truth and we are guided and those are all the kuffar the no good people who don't have that guidance and so we either force it on them or we don't have anything to do with them right that's exclusivist mentality or is islam a merciful interaction between the believers and the message that they carry and the rest of the world who doesn't know about that message i would obviously tell you what the holy quran emphasizes time and time again and it even defined the whole entire meaning of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam being sent as mercy to all of the worlds rahmatan lil alamin so unfortunately you do have interpreters from our history that the concept of power and domination may be got to them more than the original attitude of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when we look at the fact that there were political struggles and battles that took place where muslims took political control over certain lands the reason why that happened was because those tyrants were oppressing their people in many ways one of them being they refused to allow the people of their empire to have the freedom to choose and to see islam if they so wanted to they said don't bring your religion here right so the purpose of the war was not to politically subjugate people it was to open up the means so that people could see the beauty of islam and the way they saw that was because muslims integrated with their society And so when we see that the Muslims went to Indonesia and Malaysia we see that Muslims went there as traders there was no military no khilafa ever in Malaysia or Indonesia right Muslims came there in boats with business they set up their shop they integrated they interacted with the people they have this character and this way of acting that impressed upon their neighbors that they all slowly over centuries chose to embrace Islam and that's the natural order of things nobody will convert to islam because you said islam is right because my religion says so my quran said you have to be muslim otherwise you're doomed nobody i w- i would challenge you to bring me one person that that's their story wallahi what happened was i was just talking with this muslim guy and he came up and said you better convert to islam because it's the truth and i said wow i should probably convert to islam because it's the truth i don't think that there's a person like that so the question is can muslims have friends that are non-muslims 
right? As a new Muslim, whenever I embraced Islam 15, 16 years ago, I can remember reading some translation of the Qur'an and I was impressed with the whole Qur'an to solve my theological and philosophical dilemmas. And so I embraced it as the Word of God. But I kind of had this confusion when reading this translation, don't take them as friends, don't take disbelievers as friends. I read this translation. And so I've heard many religious people saying that. I'm sure you've heard this, haven't you? I can't imagine you haven't because I heard it um, uh, many times within my first few years of being a Muslim. And I've heard it from many parents that they want to shelter their kids from interacting at all with non-Muslims. Um, the biggest problem that, that this causes is we did not integrate into this society thoroughly, right? Particularly those who hold on to the religion because religious people and sheikhs and interpreters of the Qur'an are telling them, don't make friends from those kuffar, they will corrupt you. Which is a lack of confidence in your faith in the first point. If you are true in what you believe, and you have researched the evidence and your heart has opened up and embraced Islam truly as your chosen faith, not some traditional cultural attachment of your forefathers, then you would have no problem integrating and dealing with people who are not Muslim, right? Because you know who you are and you stand for what you stand for and nothing's going to break you, right? So this is the issue that I've went to many churches and many non-Muslims that I have met and people that I know and you know what their biggest concern is after 9-11? I don't really know many Muslims. I may have worked with one, I may have had them as neighbors, but I just don't know them. And the reason why is this translation or this interpretation that was given to many Muslims thinking that we are being mutahafidin, we're being careful in our protecting our religion in the land of the disbelievers. When in fact I'm sure that the Muslims that went to Indonesia did not have such an attitude. Because why? The early generations understood Islam a lot deeper and they had a much more uh, expensiveness and comprehensiveness in the way they dealt with things. So, my biggest issue with this interpretation is that contextually and linguistically, no verse in the Qur'an is saying don't have friends that are non-Muslims. Is, it is a very weak and strange opinion. And so the basis for trying to use such an interpretation which discards linguistics and contextual realities is sadda dhari'a. Oh, we have to protect the means to possibly falling into a problem. So there's this negative pessimism that led to such a weak interpretation becoming commonplace in the translations of the Qur'an and so place. So now when we look at the concept of uh, the Qur'an, if the Qur'an contained all the context you needed to understand it perfectly, do you know how many volumes would be the Qur'an? If every single ayah had context in the ayah, deep context in it, we have a hard time memorizing the Qur'an, much less Ramadan would be very long. We're having a hard time reading it as it is, and it's quite small, 600 pages. So that is why the Sunnah was preserved. That is why it's there. The Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and the Seerah of the uh, Khulafa al-Rashidin and the Ashab al-Nabi ﷺ is fully, deeply, meticulously preserved for the reason of if there's a verse that we're not sure, because many, I would dare say, most verses of the Qur'an dealing with law or interaction in worldly matters could carry various interpretations, right? So that's Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, Al-Qur'an hammalatul wujuh. The Qur'an carries many possible interpretations in it. Right? So we need to go to the Sunnah. We need to go to the books of Tafsir. We need to go to the Asbab and Nuzul to find how do we properly understand this verse. So my question that I ask the people of the scholars overseas in the Muslim world, how did you make this general fatwa and then give it to people and have it translated into English and cut and paste it all over the internet? It's haram to have friends that are non-Muslims. Right? How, what kind of scholarship does that? Particularly when you don't know who it's being applied to. Ibn Qayyim says that the true mufti cannot be a mufti unless they understand where their fatwa is going to be applied and to whom it is applied and the cultural consequences that that holds in it. 
in his book, I'lam al muwaqqeen which is a book written for any scholar who would give a fatwa, right? And it's used as a umda, as a standard in principle. We have a very, 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 we can, in the whole ummah, there's a lack of professionalism and a lack of intellectualism in the whole ummah. Unfortunately, that carries over with regarding our scholarship. So you see all these fatwas that are saying this, cut and paste all over the place, and it causes much harm to our community. So now you have the need for deep scholarship. We need people to encourage their children. If they show yearning and desiring to learn the depth of the meaning of Islam and its law, don't say, oh no, 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 you'll not become anything with that son. You need to be a doctor and engineer. You are by that doing something that is very, very, very un-Islamic and very, very, very secular in your attitude. And we need to know where these ideas came from that are in our minds because they did not come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger. We need intellectual scholars with wisdom and insight that have leadership qualities and to not just put the people with the weakest level of knowledge, oh, put them in the Islamic studies or when we don't have any hope for doctor, engineer, we say, okay, maybe he'll be a sheikh. This is unfortunately commonplace in the Muslim world. And we need to stop this because it has caused major problems in the Muslim world. Right here in Charlotte, I would argue. So the first ayah, لا يتخذ المؤمنون الكافرين أولياء من دون المؤمنين ومن يفعل ذلك فليس من الله في شيء إلا أن تتقوا منهم تقا. This ayah is the first ayah that is used, right? So the ayah basically means believers should not take disbelievers as awliya to the exclusion of the believers. Whoever would do as such would disconnect themselves from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a literal quick reading will give you the idea. Oh, it looks like we're not supposed to have awliya. Now I'm asking anybody in here that speaks Arabic. When's the last time you referred to your friend as wali? Oh, this is my wali. La, you call him sadiq, you call him rafiq, you call him sahib. No Arab ever in the history of Arabic language was referring to his buddy as wali, right? The word wali in Arabic and awliya, which is the plural, is referring to a political authority or guardianship. Wali al-amr, this is the ruler of the nation, right? Wali al-ahd, the person who has political or authoritative legal influence. Wali al-mar'ah, when this is Islamic law 101. Who is the one that looks into the man that off offers to marry the daughter? That's the father, he's the wali. He is not her friend, because uh, her friends might all say, oh, he's a nice guy, he'll get married. That's not what we're looking for here. We're looking for someone with a deep concern, with wisdom, with leadership qualities and authoritative legal influence over the matter, right? So the word in and of itself, which they're trying to translate as friend, is not properly used as friend, in and of itself. Imam al-Tabari, if you don't know about him, you should know. He was one of the greatest, he's called Imam al He's one of the greatest scholars of Quranic commentary. And so in the third century, he gathered all of the companions and the tabi'een's different uh, tafsirs of the Quran and he put them together and then added his commentary to all of that. It was a beautiful, very long tafsir. So Imam al tabari says, this verse is God, the mighty and exalted, prohibiting the believers from taking the disbelievers as political supporters. Don't support them against the Muslims, exposing the weaknesses of the Muslims to them, whoever does so is separated from God for their having apostated in their religion. So Imam Al-Tabari gives you the context of meaning by saying, this is referring to Muslims having special ties with non-Muslims who are working against the Muslims and so they start telling them stuff to help them to work against the Muslims. This is Imam Al-Tabari, which is treachery to the believers, which is a type of disbelief according to the majority of scholars. So then he narrates a tradition of Asbab al nuzul He says Rafa'a ibn Munzir had uh, made some relations with a very famous Jew who was known as Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, who was the most adamant Jew about hating the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu after the Treaty of Medina was drawn up and there was an official state constitution which unified Jews, polytheists and Muslims in Medina. That the Prophet ﷺ, we talked about it before in a previous khutbah. So for Rafa' ibn Munzir was uh, working with Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf and he was advised against that. 
and him and some of his friends, after working with Ka'b ibn Ashraf, started to form hypocrisy and started to go against the religion behind the scenes. And Imam al tabari says, the verse was revealed regarding this matter. So when you see the context of what it's talking about, and when the verse was revealed into what situation, you will see that by no means is this verse talking about making friends with non-Muslims, regardless of how close you are to them. Uh, this, is, this verse is in context and linguistics talking about a prohibition of Muslims politically aligning with non-Muslims who have an agenda against Islam, talking to them as best friends and close supporters and looking to them for political support. And so uh, this is uh, clearly the meaning that we see here. How would be the modern application? The modern application is not don't make friends with your neighbor or your schoolmate or your colleague at work. The modern application is do not take your news from Fox. Do not support the Republican Party, right? I know I'm not supposed to say that, but I'm saying there is in the Republican Party an anti-Islam vibe. That element from a religious standpoint a true Muslim would not support because they are working against Muslims. They are trying to get Muslims have problems for them, have them expelled to support wars against them and so forth and so on. So that element we are against, no question about from a religious standpoint not from a political campaigning standpoint, right? To join the military, right? Now it seems that our military is not valuing the sacredness of Muslim life and the sovereignty of Muslim nations. So we would not support going into the military. Many Muslim parents tell me, I'm thinking about putting my son in the military. I said, hold on, are you aware what's going on in the world? This is not a good idea. Before 9-11, I didn't see any problem with that and many of the ulama were saying, no big deal, you defend your country which are regardless of what it is, that's fine. But when your country is actively supporting oppressive incursions, particularly against Muslims, that are not based upon any real sound evidence and it causes much death and bloodshed to innocent people and it's not stopping just the uh, criminal element, then we would take a stand against that according to this ayah of the Qur'an. Not don't make friends with the non-Muslims. The other ayah is uh, very famous from Surah Al-Ma'idah. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tattakhidu al-yahuda wa al-nasara awliya ba'dhuhum awliya u ba'dh. Wa may yatawallahum minkum fa innahu minhum. So then the next ayah basically says, Dear believers, don't take the Jews and the Christians as awliya. They are but awliya of each other. And if anyone among you takes them as awliya, surely he is one of them. God does not guide the oppressors. Imam al-Tabari, again, the Imam al-Mufassirin, he says, the early generations have differed about this verse. Some took it as general, many others took it as specific to a contextual event in the prophetic biography regarding hypocrites and their relationship with the treacherous Jews that lived around them. Again, after the Jews had broke, he is now Imam al-Tabari, we're quoting translation of his tafsir. After the Jews have broken their treaty and their pact of constitutional value in their state with the Muslims, then uh, some of them came back to the Prophet ﷺ, some of the Muslims. Muslims. And they said, Abu Adam and Samit, one of the great pious Muslims, he says, after what they have done, Ya Rasulullah, I am breaking all of my political ties that I had financially and economically and politically with these people. And then the Abdullah bin Ubay, the head of the hypocrites, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I can't do that. I feel for my financial stability and my livelihood and you know, they, they have a strong political influence around here in this area. I can't break my ties with them. And so then the ayah was revealed about the head of the hypocrites saying in his hypocrisy that I must keep my political ties with these uh, Jews. So once again you have Imam al-Tabari giving you the context and the meaning which is very clear within the context of Muslims, claimant Muslims. So then Imam al-Qurtubi, another great scholar of the giants, the Immat uh, al-Tafsir, he says about it, this verse is referring to the hypocrites. The understood meaning is, oh you who openly claim faith, yet you're secretly hiding hypocrisy, making deals with the disbelievers, informing them uh, of the Muslims' internal affairs. So then uh, Imam al-Qurtubi mentioned the story of Abdullah bin Ubay again, and then he says that this ayah, when it says, uh, these people will be 
uh, ally, aligned an allegiance to each other, and Muslims will have theirs. This was an abrogation of a common Arab practice that I'm sure you didn't know about, which said that when you have a political economic alliance, there will be internal inheritance that goes between those people. So Imam Al-Qurtubi said this was a, an abrogation of such inheritance that now Islam was saying that these people are not inheriting from the Muslims as a result. And then he mentioned, uh, the, the, as we said, the story. So uh, this is referring once again to Muslims who form political allegiances and alliances with people who have agendas against the religion of Islam. That is the context of the verse. That is the sound meaning and understanding of it. Now I'm sure some of you heard some people that they're trying to be balanced because they read the they read what it, maybe it looks like it says well, you know you can't make friends with non-Muslims. So they said you can't be best friends with non-Muslims. You can't love the non-Muslims. Once again, that meaning is nowhere found in these two verses or any other verse of the Holy Quran at all. As a matter of fact, the Quran would refute that in which it says. Uh, that you can marry a woman who is a Jew or a Christian. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defined marriage with جَعْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً He said you can marry a non-Muslim and the core of any sound marriage is mercy and affectionate love. So how, God forbid, could somebody be married to someone and they're not allowed to affectionately love them and be very close to them? So this is a Quranic refutation of such a claim. Case in point done, it's closed. There is no re respected scholar who could say you cannot have close friends that are non-Muslims or even love them as people, right? So, of course, and the love and religion is specific to your religion. You love the religion of Islam and what it all, the teachings that are there, and you love the people who love that and have a special relationship with them. Obviously, you're not going to have a love for someone who purports something that's polytheistic or against your religion. You wouldn't love that type of religious belief, and for that reason, you wouldn't go to them, go with them to their religious place of worship for the purpose of soaking up the value of what you see is not the right religion, right? So this is obviously a different point all together. So some claimants that use a verse that says, La tajidu qawmahi yu'minuna billahi wal yawmi al-akhiri wa adduna man had Allah wa rasoolah. So this verse basically says, you will not find any people who believe in Allah and the last day and the hereafter, that they will have affectionate love for anyone who has shown enmity and hatred to Allah and His Messenger. Even if it be their father and their mother, and their children, and their brothers, and the rest of their family, right? So the problem with this is that all of the commentators are in agreement that this verse was revealed after the Battle of Badr, when Abd Abu Ubaidah bin al-Jarrah radiallahu ta'ala anhu had to kill his father. So his father has come out in a battle with a sword, fighting against Muslims, and Abu Ubaidah sees him and fights him and kills him. The verse is revealed, right? Telling you, if you have people that are in your family that hate Islam so much, that spread so much enmity towards Islam, and they're fighting wars against Muslims, then at that point you're going to say, لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَ دين. I have no allegiance, loyalty, or relationship with you if that is your approach. That being said, we have other verses that would tell us its own, that would specify it only to a war because you have Asma bint Abi Bakr whose mother was a disbeliever and she came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Mecca and said my mother is cursing Islam and all of this what should I do he said Saliha keep your relationship with your mother and keep it tight so Luqman it said the same thing unless your parents tell you disbelieve you have to have the utmost respect kindness and obedience to them when they say disbelief, you say, this is where I draw the line with all love and respect to you as my mother or father or family member that's not Muslim. Here, I will not listen to you and I will go on my way until you choose to have a different interaction with me, with respect, right? So this is um, that. Now, what does the Quran teach about having relations uh, with non-Muslims. Uh, we will leave uh, the, the three long ayat. We'll give you the general meaning. It's in Surah Al-Mumtahana. Surah Al-Mumtahana, I think, verse 7 through 9. And basically it says, Perhaps God will bring loving affection between you and your enemies 
as God is omnipotent. He is forgiving and merciful. God would not prohibit you from dealing good and fair with people who have, ex who have not expelled you from your land or fought against your religion. Indeed, God loves the just. He only prohibits you from any loyalty to those who have fought your religion and worked to expel you out of your land and your homes. Whoever would have loyalty to such people are surely the crooked and iniquitous. Right? So what the Qur'an is telling us here is that you don't know who will become Muslim and who will not. You don't know who will support the Muslims and who will not. Some people supported Islam before they were Muslim, like Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, did so much before we knew of any Islam. Some scholars said, well, he was hiding his Islam, but we have no evidence for that. That is a claim, that is an interpretation. What we see is that he was a polytheist in Mecca, who was with everybody else, who's against Islam and the Muslims, and he was supporting the Prophet ﷺ in one way or another. And we have many of the leaders, Abu Sufyan and Khalid ibn Walid, who were actually made wars against the Muslims, and alhamdulillah they became Muslims. So we don't say, all those are doomed, those kufar, we hate them all. There is no attitude like that. There is hope of rahmah and the guidance to come to anybody. So it says here, the context is there again. God would not forbid you. He will not tell you, do not have good relationships relationships and righteousness and honest fairness with people who have not fought your religion and kicked you out of your home, right? He would only tell you, do not have these relationships and allegiances to people who fought your religion and kicked you out of your homes. It's giving you the context of all the previous words. When you see, Take it as a rule of thumb. It's talk, read the whole surah. This is Surah Muhammad or Surah Al-Fatih. It's talking about the battles with the polytheists and it talks about the hypocrites right, at, right before that. It's talking about those people who have fought against Islam. We are Ruhama for the whole earth. Many, many hadiths, we've given whole sermons about it that are general for all people on planet earth. We should have that mercy, compassion, love, sincerity, kindness for all people, right? This is the teaching of Islam. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to correct our understandings and inspire us with truth. <coughs> Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. As we see here um, in the Quran, there is no teaching of a prohibition for Muslims to have friends with non Muslims. That being said, I would like to remind everybody that I have seen it. I, I was with one brother, and uh, you know, he, they were, there's this pool place out by the clubhouse of an of a, of a apartment complex. And so I'm standing out there and I see this brother going in there. And I know in there is girls in bikinis and guys with beer. And you know, I saw this guy and he's going in there and he's like, yeah, he's like, I'm just going to hang out with Muslims, right? <laughs> Okay, I'm saying there's not much going on with Islam in there. I don't think Islam is what's happening. I don't care what they're called. I don't care what the people called themselves. Islam is not a label that makes you all good, right? You don't go to Jannah, everybody's waiting to get in Jannah, Yom al Qiyamah. Let me see your passport. Oh, you're called Muslim? Your name is Muhammad? Okay, khalas, you're going in here. The other one, oh, this is John. Oh, me, I was the Imam, man. <laughs> Doesn't work that way, right? So this is, we have to embrace our religion and see the value of what it means to spread the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu to the whole world. We have to integrate, we have to make friends. Obviously when someone says we're gonna have a beer party or drinking, at that point we have values, we have lines to draw, right? We're not gonna hang out with people and then not pray. We're gonna, you know, as a matter of fact, please forgive me, I have to go make my salat right quick. I'll be right back and we can chill, you know, whatever it is, you know. We have values, but we also have to get to know people. When people get to know Muslims, when they know you people here, good, pious, righteous people who have good intentions and good values, when, when the non-Muslims get to know you and they have friends with you, then they will not believe what they see on Fox News. But the problem is Fox News is taking a heavy advantage of their ignorance of us and that's our fault. 
Okay, we have to integrate in the society. We have to let people know who we are. Obviously, the most close companions and the people we want to spend most of our time with are people who share our values and are going to raise our faith and our status and spirituality. That being said, we should not think that there's any prohibition against having uh, friends from non-Muslims. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide our community to be unified amongst ourselves, to have a proper understanding of Islam, to integrate in society and to share the mercy and compassion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with our neighbors. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when Muslims are seen, Allah is respected and remembered for what they represent. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our shortnesses and weaknesses and shortcomings, that we become people who take a stronger motivation towards our religion. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our sins and make us people who seek righteousness and uh, repentance in our lives. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to motivate us and to make us those who work for his religion and earn our way into paradise by following the example of the Prophet Sallallahu and the early generations of the believers.